Greetings and salutations everybody, it's Mr. Bear here with another video designed to give you a quick overview of important topics in writing, grammar, and literary analysis. Prepare for another super califragilistic expialidocious episode of... Bear Essentials! Language Today's video is the second in a series of five examining the five elements of everyone's favorite tone analysis acronym... Ditto! Remember that DIDDLE stands for Diction, Imagery, Details, Language, and Syntax. I'll begin by covering a quick review of terms related to imagery and figurative language, and I'll end by showing an example of tone analysis using imagery from a piece of fiction. Now, our second diddles element, imagery, is probably the easiest one for most students to wrap their brains around. Even if you don't know the specific names of techniques in figurative language, like hyperbole or illusion, I guarantee you've both heard and used them countless times in your everyday conversations. When it comes to communication, there are a lot of variables that can affect meaning, such as facial expression, body posture, gesture, and vocal qualities like volume, 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 or texture. 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 But the language we use is far more flexible and potentially more impactful on meaning. Did you know that the English language is the largest in human history with almost 175,000 recognized words? Russia is a close second with about 150,000, while Spanish takes the bronze medal with a measly 93,000. And thanks to those worldwide interwebs, your access to language is greater than it's been since ever. Back in my day, we used to have to go to a library uphill in the snow, in the driving snow, both ways to check out a book. And the librarians used to beat us and spray us with mustard gas if we returned our books late. And the only way we could read at night was to light our fingertips on fire and hold them in front of the pages. And we were thankful to have that. So let that be a lesson to you. Eat your vegetables. I'm old, I don't have to make sense. So, what was my point? Oh yeah, imagery. If you're an English speaker, especially a native speaker, you have heard and used imagery pretty much every day for years and years and years. Authors count on that, and they take advantage of that because finding creative and memorable ways to activate your imagination, imagination, imagery, mmm is the most powerful way to connect the reader to the characters in the story, or in nonfiction, connecting the reader to the author and the subject. So, let's quickly review some common types of imagery using the following scenario as a foundation. Me hitting myself in the face with this hammer. Now, I haven't really rehearsed this, so I'm kind of hoping for the best. Oh, and just in case, <clears throat> I, Mr. Bear, being of sound mind, <laughs> thank you, honey, do hereby will and bequeath all of my assets to my son and all of my debts to my wife. Hey! Love you. Okay, all right. A little nervous. Here we go. We're going to... Hang on, get those out of the way. Okay, we're gonna start with personification. Okay, here we go. Pain has put on soccer spikes and is clog dancing on the back of my eyeball right now. Oh, okay, next is metaphor. <sighs> A river of lava is coursing through my forehead at this very moment. Oh, next up is the simile. Uh, 
it feels like somebody shoved a road flare in my cheekbone and it's trying to work its way out of my skull. Oh. Next up is understatement. Mm. Mm. That is unpleasant. Next one is illusion. Here we go. And when I had opened the seventh wound, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. And I saw the seven lacerations which bled before God and to each of them was given seven stitches. Uh, next one is oh, I, hyperbole. I got a riddle for you. What's 1999? It's one of Prince's best songs. It's a pretty good price for a bouquet of long-stemmed red roses. And it's the number of tooth fragments that I've swallowed so far. And last but not least is onomatopoeia. Allow me to demonstrate. So, there you have it, figurative language in action. This next part, I hope, is a little bit of a review. In addition to these devices called figurative language or figures of speech, we can also add simple uses of sensory imagery, using words and phrases which appeal to the different senses. Sensory imagery has such a powerful impact on the mind that certain words and phrases can even activate our memories of several senses at once. For example, just think of a jumbo cinnamon roll. Now, thinking about that cinnamon roll gives you more than just some sort of visual picture of that roll. Golden brown, dark smears of baked cinnamon in every concentric circle, slathered in pearlescent icing, which has run down the sides of the roll and is pooled on the plate. Embedded in that visual image is the smell of the cinnamon and that yeasty aroma of the pastry with maybe a little hint of vanilla from the icing. And the texture and the tactile sensation of that freshly warmed roll as you bite into it, it's maybe a little crisp perhaps on the edges, but it's chewy, almost doughy on the inside, especially when you get to that little knot of goodness right in the center. And what about the taste? The warm, earthy spice of the cinnamon blending with that cloying sweetness of the icing, both against the backdrop of a sugary, buttery pastry. Oh yeah, I almost forgot the best part of a cinnamon roll, the sound. Here's what a cinnamon roll sounds like. Mm -hmm. I might have to do a few more takes of this. I, didn't, I don't think I got it quite right. Let me try it again. Oh, mmm, mmm, mmm. Does that sound better? I have a better sound. Mm. So there's plenty of places online to find lists of words to describe each of those five senses. Just Google sensory words. You'll find all kinds of lists.
Now, to close the video, we're going to take a quick look at how the technique of using sensory words and figurative language, collectively labeled imagery, works in a literary selection when it comes to the tone of the piece. So here's an excerpt from the novel Airhead by Meg Cabot, who also wrote the Princess Diaries novels, by the way. The narrator, Emerson Watts, is a 16-year-old student at a private school, and in this selection, she recounts an episode from a public speaking class. So we will start with uh, reading the selection. Emerson Watts called my first period public speaking teacher, Mr. Greer, startling me from the light doze into which I'd drifted. Well, whatever. Do they really expect us to be alert at 8.15 in the morning? Come on. Here, I called, jerking my head from the top of my desk and surreptitiously feeling the side of my mouth just in case I'd been drooling. But I guess I didn't do it surreptitiously enough, since Whitney Robertson, seated with her long, tanned legs crossed beneath a desk a few feet away from mine, snickered and hissed, Loser! I threw her a dirty look and mouthed, Bite me! To which she responded by narrowing her heavily made up, oops, sorry, <laughs> To which she responded by narrowing her heavily made-up baby blue eyes at me, mouthing back smugly, You wish. M, Mr. Greer said with a yawn. I guess he'd been up pretty late last night, too. Only I'm guessing it wasn't because he'd been frantically finishing his homework for this class, like I was. I wasn't calling roll. It's time for you to give the class your two-minute persuasive oral piece. We're going in reverse alphabetical order, remember? Great. Just great. Chagrined, I slid out from behind my desk and made my way to the front of the room while the rest of the class tittered. All except Whitney, I saw. That's because she had dug her compact mirror out of her bag and was gazing at her own reflection. Lindsay Jacobs, seated in the row beside hers, stared at Whitney admiringly and whispered, That shade of gloss is so you. I know, Whitney murmured to her reflection. So, with any selection, long or short, poetry or prose, we start our analysis with a simple question. What is this selection about? What is the subject matter that the narrator is talking about in this excerpt? Well, in this case, most of the narrator Emerson's thoughts are about a classmate, Whitney, the stereotypically self-obsessed beauty queen. Next, once we know the subject, then we need to consider the tone. What is the attitude of the narrator towards that subject? In other words, how does Emerson feel about Whitney? Well, it ain't good. I'll bet you that some of you watching and reading along might have done one of these. That kind of thing, right? Guess what you just did, by the way? You used imagery. That was onomatopoeia and metaphor. We even have a word for it, acting caddy. It's a great metaphor because the attitude of some cats who can be extremely jealous of rival cats and highly territorial pretty closely resembles the attitudes of certain types of high school girls or high school boys or grown people, which is actually a pretty serious problem when it comes to the idea of appearance shaming. But this author clearly wants to play up that rivalry rather than take the opportunity to have her characters model good behavior. In any case, catty would be a pretty good tone word. Other good choices might be bitter, envious, even hateful, and snarky. Yes, snarky is a perfectly viable word when talking about tone. In fact, let's go ahead and use that one as our choice. And don't forget, tone words should almost always be adjectives, descriptive words. Uh, you should be able to say a blank tone and the word that goes into that blank would be an adjective. And so, if we're writing a paragraph, we already have a rock-solid topic sentence in place. Here it is. In her novel, Airhead, Meg Cabot uses imagery to give her narrator a snarky tone. We have our title, we have our author, we have our technique, we have our tone word. Bing, bang, boom, done. So, after we have our topic sentence, after we know we're going to be talking about imagery, and we're talking about a snarky tone on the part of the narrator, we need to find us some evidence. So here it is. So what we can see is on these two slides that have the text on it, uh, we have a few different examples of uh, sensory details and figurative language from this particular excerpt. And one of the things that we notice is that Emerson, the narrator, really seems to be focused on Whitney's appearance. The very first thing that we get, our first look at Whitney, is focused on her long, tanned legs. Not just her legs, but the fact that they're long and tanned. And the way that she describes it almost makes it sound like she thinks that that's some sort of character flaw. 
um, when she describes the way that Whitney refers to her. She says that she snickers and hisses. Those are very negative things. Um, the fact that she throws her a dirty look and when they talk to each other, they don't talk to each other out loud. They mouth things to each other. She has heavily made up baby blue eyes, not just her eyes and the color, but the fact that they're heavily made up. That word especially contributes to that visual image. On the next slide, uh, we have Whitney not looking at herself in the mirror, but gazing at her own reflection. And she murmurs to her reflection. There's a sense that she's lost in her own image. And that gives us this impression that Emerson really doesn't like her. And her dislike is based primarily on Whitney's uh, appearance and the fact that Whitney really likes her own appearance. So just to have a couple of examples from different places in the selection, we're going to take this first one with the long tanned legs, and we're going to also take the example of her gazing at her own reflection. Um, especially this word gazing, uh, I think really gives a good impression. The word sounds uh, kind of hypnotic, like mesmerize and hypnotize and gaze. It has that kind of a sound to it as if Whitney is completely lost in herself. So those two uh, pieces of evidence are going to be the ones that we're going to use for our paragraph. Now, the thing is that these are not the only two examples, the ones that we're going to use for our paragraph. They're not the only two examples of imagery in this entire excerpt. And in fact, uh, Emerson, the narrator, covers a lot of different subjects besides just Whitney. She clearly seems to indicate kind of a frustrated and condescending tone towards her teacher, her class, and just the fact that she has to be there, for example. In addition to that, she very briefly, but very meaningfully, slams Whitney's toady, Lindsay, giving her this ditzy phrase, it's so you, and that's bad enough, but pairing it up with that admiring stare, it leaves absolutely no doubt in our minds that Lindsay is just a sidekick, a henchman, a suck up, and we probably are not going to hear anything intelligent come out of her mouth for the entire book. And that's all of that, just from a phrase and the way that she looks at her. That's the power of language. So this would be a good place to pause the video so you can kind of take in the whole paragraph and read it. But this is an example of what a paragraph would look like using the two examples that we chose and using our ESEC or ESESEC paragraph model here at Dallas High School. Here we have our topic sentence. This next one is what we would call an expansion sentence or a refining sentence. It just kind of narrows down the topic just a little bit. So the next two elements that we have here are the uh, evidence and the analysis of that evidence kind of paired up in a little uh, chunk. And then as part of the ESESEC paragraph, what we do is we use that same technique one more time, another piece of evidence and another uh, bit of analysis to support that evidence and connect it back to the topic sentence. And then finally, we wrap up the paragraph with a concluding sentence that ties it all back to the opening sentence and the topic of our paragraph. And that's all there is to it. So there you have it. Imagery, sensory language, and literary analysis all hammered out in just a few minutes. <laughs> I guess we, we hit the nail right on the head. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how's this for a pound sign? <laughs> hey, these videos are really a, a powerful tool for learning, aren't they? <laughs> I'll, I'll stop now. Tune in next time for more. Medicine Show!